Well, there is this old notion that uh, all the planets are going around in these nice uniform orbits, and it's all running like clockwork, and it is a very peaceful, tranquil place out there. That's a myth. Someday, the Earth will get hit by a comet and an asteroid. It'll happen. There's no way out of it. It has happened in the past. Well, there's thousands of asteroids out there that could potentially hit the Earth. And as of now, we only know of about three or 400 of them. If you have 2,000 objects with diameters of a kilometer or more, with orbits that cross the Earth's orbit, a significant fraction of those are going to hit the Earth. It's not if, it's when. If nature hit a large metropolitan area like Los Angeles, it would simply obliterate all of Los Angeles and the surrounding region. There would have been a cloud covering the entire planet within two hours, and it would have lasted for a year. Easily would have caused mass extinctions. You have years of kind of a nuclear winter effect where you just wouldn't get any sunlight. 10 million people would have been killed virtually instantly. Imagine one Hiroshima strength bomb being exploded every second for several years. What follows are facts from scientists and astronomers that explain why fire from the sky could become tomorrow's news. As new technology has brought the universe closer to us, we have begun to realize that cataclysmic destruction is business as usual in the cosmos. Recent images from the Hubble telescope reveal whole galaxies cartwheeling into each other. Some scientists believe that Mars was once a green planet with oceans much like Earth, until a series of tremendous impacts blew away the Martian atmosphere and left it a dead planet. Venus is littered with tremendous impact craters, many the size of a small country. But it was a massive impact into Jupiter in 1994 that revealed the magnitude of the threat to Earth. Tracking the objects that sometimes cause these collisions has been the lifelong pursuit of astronomer David Levy. I'm a bit of a klutz. I fell off my bicycle, broke my arm, and uh, my cousin gave me a get well present. It was a book about the planets. And I read that book and I thought, gee, that's, that's what I'd like to do for the rest of my life. And so at age 12, I decided to become an astronomer. Meteor Crater near Flagstaff, Arizona, is the most perfectly preserved impact crater on Earth. Gene Shoemaker is the geologist in residence. Almost nobody was working on it in the mid-1950s when I first came here to Meteor Crater uh, and started to study this crater in very great detail. So once you've studied this kind of a thing, your next question is, well, you know, what are the bullets out there that make these things? And how often do they hit? David Levy, along with Gene Shoemaker and his wife, Carolyn, have teamed to become the most prolific comet hunters ever. Together, they have found 13 comets. But in 1993, they found a comet that would give Earth a first-hand education as to what happens when comets meet planets. I think that the seminal event that really alerted everyone to, the, the, to, to yes, Virginia, comets do hit planets, was the collision of Shoemaker-Levy 9 into Jupiter. In all the years I've observed, I've never seen a comet like this. I've never seen anything like this. There were at least five separate comets all together with the dust wings on either side and then the tails going off to the north. Which later became to be called a string of pearls. There were many little comets all lined up, each one going on its own orbit, uh, but very closely related orbits. And it was clear that this had once been one comet 
that had gotten too close to Jupiter and had been torn apart in the gravity field of Jupiter. Not long after discovering Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, they learned the comet was on a course that would lead to its own violent end. Well, I said, oh my gosh. And Carolyn stopped and said, what, what? And I said, our comet's going to collide with Jupiter in 16 months from now. I think for the next half hour, the three of us just stared at the announcement and, and read it. And Jean was saying, I don't believe it. We're going to see a collision in my lifetime. On July the 16th, the first fragment of Shoemaker-Levy 9 crashed into Jupiter, traveling at a speed of 140,000 miles per hour. It would be able to cross the United States in a couple of seconds at that speed. It tore into Jupiter. Really, Jupiter didn't know what hit it. The explosion from the first fragment of Shoemaker-Levy 9 rose over 2,000 miles above Jupiter's cloud tops. And the, a few hours later, another one hit. The next day, another one hit. Jupiter got hit, bam, 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 at least 16 times over the course of six days. But the most powerful impact was yet to come. Fragment G exploded into Jupiter, raising a fireball visible from Earth. It left a cloud larger than the Earth and a cloud that lasted on Jupiter for almost a year. One of the questions that, that we all had when we were watching this enormous damage done to Jupiter was, well, what if it had been us? Imagine one Hiroshima strength bomb being exploded every second for several years. That is the energy released by Shoemaker leaving on in this collision with Jupiter. The magnitude of the impacts into Jupiter surprised and alarmed the scientific community. And one of the big discussions was, how do we get rid of the giggle factor? We go to Congress and we say, a comet could hit the Earth someday, and everyone laughs. After Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, nobody was laughing. Only in the last 50 years have we begun to accept the fact that Earth is a potential target, even though the evidence was hanging right in front of us. Our moon bears the scars of over 30,000 impacts, but for centuries, we believed Earth was somehow spared these bombardments. In the last 20 years, we have identified 180 impact craters on Earth. If you could strip away Earth's jungles and oceans, scientists believe we would find another 2,000 craters. At the northern tip of the Cancun Peninsula, Chichlub is the largest crater ever found on Earth at just under 300 miles. Many believe this X marks the spot where the asteroid struck that killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. But even in this century, Earth has been a target. The biggest impact in recorded history mystified turn-of-the-century London and drew the attention of Irish astronomer Mark Bailey. 1908, there's a very bright, very, very bright light was seen in the sky emanating from the southeast. The twilight, even though it was June the 30th, was very, very light to the extent that people were able to play cricket at night, people were reports of reading newspapers after midnight, which would no, not normally ever be able to do that. The scientific journals and the newspapers were full of this unusual phenomenon at the time, and there was speculation as to what caused it, but no answer. Seismographs in Belgium recorded a tremendous shock wave emanating from a remote region in Siberia. Russian meteorologist Leon Kulik believed the event was caused by the impact of a meteor. It took him almost 20 years to mount an expedition to recover what he thought would be valuable minerals from the meteor. As he approached the recorded epicenter, Kulik passed mile after mile of forest laid over like matchsticks. 
Kulik searched for years, mounting two later expeditions, but he never found an impact crater or the meteor. The cause of the massive destruction became the subject of speculation. Everything from an earthquake to an exploding spaceship were offered as a possible explanation. Dr. Jasper Wall of the Royal Greenwich Observatory believes a meteor caused the massive destruction, one that did not impact the Earth, but detonated miles above the forest floor. Now, it didn't actually strike the Earth's surface, but what it did do is uh, burn up in a fearful fireball above the Earth's surface, perhaps a mile above the Earth's surface, sending a shock wave down, which, which struck uh, the Earth and devastated, flattened the trees. It had an energy yield, roughly that of one of the largest weapons, that uh, nuclear weapons that had been produced, about 30 megatons. And the first thing that happened was that the forest was set fire by the heat and the radiation. And then as the blast wave swept over the, the burning forest, the blast wave puffed out the fire. And, and you were left with a, a flattened region of devastation of some uh, one or 2,000 square kilometers in extent. So the size of a large city was wiped out by that particular object. Had it been three hours later, had the Earth moved by the equivalent of another three hours, and that event occurred over Moscow, 10 million people would have been killed virtually instantly. Scientists assured us that such an explosive event only occurred once every 100,000 years. But 22 years later, Earth was hit again. The second biggest impact that we know about, the second biggest impact in recorded history took place uh, in the Brazilian jungle in the mid-1930s. It must have seemed to the, uh, the Indians, the Aborigines, that the end of the world had come, and indeed for hundreds of them, it probably had. It was a, the dawn of a new day. The fishermen were casting their nets, the people were just having a normal Time, good time in the rainforest and suddenly this tremendous darkening of the sun so the sun goes blood red and there was these explosions in the sky and an apparent fire in the forest now the natives at the time believed that this was essentially the end of the world we know of all of this because there happened to be a Catholic missionary in the area at the time Father, Father Fideli who was embarking on his annual apostolic mission and he uh, arrived at just at a time, a few days after the impact. The reports that uh, followed from Father Fideli's diaries indicated that he'd arrived just in the nick of time as the local uh, priest or witch doctor was preparing to administer this poison called Tempo uh, to the villagers in, in the community who had been scared out of their wits by the event in the sky and were really believing that the sky god had come to ground and that it was necessary in some way to placate him by making a, a mass suicide attempt. But the fear grew beyond the Amazon rainforest as word of the destruction spread. It wasn't until years later that the truth was known. Three small asteroids exploded in tremendous fireballs a mile above the jungle floor, igniting a ground fire that destroyed over 800 square miles of rainforest. My hunch is that the Brazilian event is a much smaller example than the Tunguska, maybe only uh, 50 or 100 kilotons equivalent, and such an event probably runs into the Earth on the average about every 20 years. Both the Siberian and Brazilian impacts occurred over sparsely populated areas of the world. Is it possible that we have not always been so lucky? In 1871, Headlines around the world reported the fire that burned Chicago to the ground. The cause was reported to be a cow owned by Mrs. O'Leary. But what history has forgotten is the fact that on the same evening, at the same hour, a dozen separate fires swept through a surrounding four-state area, causing even greater devastation. Randall Carlson has devoted his lifetime to researching unexplained phenomena. He believes the inferno was another case of fire falling from the sky. The reason no one can explain these great fires is that no one knew to look to the heavens. 
But recent studies have shown that a comet nucleus, only 100 yards in diameter, exploding 20 miles up in the atmosphere, can set a large pine forest on fire. This is the only explanation that can account for the simultaneous outbreak of massive forest fires all over the Midwest on October 8, 1871. In fact, astronomers at that time were tracking the dying comet Biela, whose orbit was dangerously close to Earth. Some scientists have suggested that fragments falling from the comet may have ignited not only the Chicago fire, but the fires in neighboring states as well. The most deadly fire that night was not in Chicago, but in the small town of Peshtigo. 1,200 people died there in the worst fire in American history. A mass grave commemorates the remains of 350 of the victims burned beyond recognition. Robert Cuvillian is the president of the Peshtigo Historical Society. The stories he has preserved are of a fire unlike any other. Fire was not unusual in this territory, but uh, on this particular night, this was uh, a fire like nobody else had ever seen. It was seven or eight o'clock at night uh, when it became dark and they could see this lurid glow in the uh, western sky. It was like a thunder, a muttered thunder that never ceased. It just kept growing louder and louder. Before they could run, a firestorm blasted them off their feet. The trees were being uprooted and roofs were coming off of the homes. Uh, chimneys were crashing to the ground. Everything was moving horizontally. It was uh, like the heaviest snowstorm you've ever seen, only it contained the burning embers and the ashes and the red hot sand and the dirt that was picked up. And uh, uh, when they decided it was time to go to the river, already it was too late. The people who managed to reach the river were not yet out of danger. Clothing and hair combusted spontaneously. The air itself seemed to be on fire. Eyewitnesses described that the very sky itself was on fire as far as the eye could see into space. Survivors felt like it was the end of the world. Peshtigo was literally devoured by this fire from the sky. At sunrise the next day, survivors struggled from the riverbanks to tell stories of a night in hell. Eyewitnesses described fireball and meteorite-like phenomena falling from the sky just prior to the outbreak of the fire. In the aftermath, they described whole forests of great maple trees uprooted and laid flat like new mown hay. This is strikingly suggestive of the forests knocked flat to Tunguska. While no one was killed at Tunguska, 1,200 people lost their lives at Peshtigo. Is it possible that there have been other tragedies? Other disasters we attributed to earthquakes or fires or tidal waves only because we didn't realize how often the earth gets hit? For centuries, we've portrayed comets as fire-breathing dragons terrorizing the Earth, or as tremendous thunderbolts flung by the gods to punish us. In fact, comets are the leftover debris from the formation of the planets, giant balls of dust and ice. Impacts from comets are thought to have provided the water for Earth's oceans. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, is home to some of the world's leading experts on comet studies. Comets are rather unusual objects. The small body in the middle may be a few kilometers in diameter or even only a few hundred meters in diameter. But the atmosphere can grow to 100,000 or several hundred thousand kilometers across. And they create long tails, a dust tail and a gas tail or ion tail typically so that uh, they can have tails perhaps 100 million kilometers in length, the distance of the Earth from the sun, say 150 million kilometers. They can, in fact, appear very suddenly and surprisingly. We don't know that they're coming. 
Typically, they're found, in fact, by amateurs, simply looking with small telescopes, uh, amateurs who are well-trained and, and know how to recognize a comet when they see it. While comets are more visible and do pose a certain threat to the Earth, the greater danger is an impact by an asteroid. Asteroids are thought to be pieces of a planet that never formed. These leftover rocky fragments make up the asteroid belt that orbits the Sun between Mars and Jupiter. Groundbreaking research on near-Earth asteroids is being done by Caltech's Bill Botke. An Earth-crossing asteroid is an asteroid that has an orbit that crosses the orbit of the Earth. So these are the asteroids that could potentially impact the Earth. Right now, we estimate that there are possibly as many as 1,500 to 2,000 asteroids that are about a kilometer in size or larger that are on Earth-crossing orbits. An asteroid about the size of a house comes between the orbit of the Earth and Moon about once each day. And an asteroid the size of a football field comes between the Earth and Moon about once each month. In 1996, a graduate student in astronomy, Carl Hergenrother, witnessed a record close approach by a huge asteroid. Well, the object we found, 1996 J1, is actually a piece of an asteroid from the asteroid belt. There must have been a collision out there, and the objects hit, and the piece went flying off, and eventually ended up crossing the Earth's orbit. It was real exciting, and even a little scary at first, because um, you first see it, and you know, OK, this is heading at the Earth. And then you go, hmm, I wonder if it's going to hit. The asteroid passed within 400,000 miles of Earth. Had it been seven hours later, it would have been a direct hit. You want to find something, but you don't want to find something that interesting. <laughs> the magnitude of the asteroid threat to Earth was not a secret to everyone. For years, the U.S. military had been monitoring near space. Physicist Ed Tagliaferri succeeded in declassifying this top secret information. What we saw was that the rate of impact of the objects that hit us on a daily basis was really much higher than had been suspected before. The 10-year-long study revealed 250 high-altitude detonations, as detected by military satellites designed to find nuclear missile launches. These detonations were caused by small asteroids exploding on contact with the Earth's atmosphere. I think most people would be shocked by the amount of times, the number of times that we've been hit. The other thing that people would be shocked by is the amount of energy that these things bring in. Typically, even a small thing, something the size of a basketball, will light up the sky such that you could actually read a newspaper by it. In 1994, one such asteroid hit over the Pacific Ocean near Micronesia. It detonated at about 60,000 feet in the air, and it detonated with an energy of about 50 to 70 kilotons of TNT. That's four to five times the size of the bombs that were used in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. It was picked up by the DOD satellites. Uh, and in fact, it was picked up by the entire nuclear detection system of the US. And uh, I don't know for a fact, but I'm told that they even yanked the president out of bed on this one. 250 detonations over 10 years, 25 detonations a year, or one nuclear type explosion every two weeks. But there are still people in the government who are skittish about publishing it because it seems alarmist. Uh, when I tell you that something could happen that could wipe out the entire human race, that's alarming. You don't always need a telescope to see an asteroid or meteor. Sometimes they come too close for comfort. This meteor was captured by amateur cameramen before it finally impacted in New York State. This fireball, photographed passing 10 miles above the Earth, was large enough to have leveled a city had it hit. It streaked across three states in only a few seconds before skipping back into space. They're moving at speeds which are 5, 10, 15 times the speed of what the space shuttle moves. They're moving at speeds of 15 to 50 kilometers per second. Those are just unbelievable speeds. Because of that, they carry so much energy 
that even the, an object the size of a basketball can be uh, as energetic as a small atomic bomb. But there are massive asteroids orbiting near Earth. Asteroids that would dwarf a modern city. Asteroids that, no matter where they hit, would cause global destruction. If you hit a large metropolitan area with an iron asteroid a mile across, that would be an unimaginable catastrophe for the local area as well as for the world. It would simply obliterate. It would explode with 30,000 megatons of force more power than the entire nuclear arsenals of all the armies of the world. People at Ground Zero would never know what hit them. Millions would die in the first instant. The air, superheated to 9,000 degrees, would ripple outward hundreds of miles and millions more would perish. An entire metropolitan city would be wiped from the face of the Earth. But you would be no better off if the impact occurred over the ocean. People sometimes think that if an object were to hit in the ocean, that this would not create a problem, that much better hit in the ocean than on land. But the problem is that if you got a one mile in diameter body hitting in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, it would create a tidal wave that would probably wipe out all of the coastal cities bordering on the Pacific Ocean. The waves rushing onto the land would tower miles into the air. Coastal cities would be inundated. Floodwaters would rush hundreds of miles inland, sweeping millions of people to watery graves. But what's even more horrific is that the same thing happens on land. Just as an impact on water creates a tidal wave, a large impact on land would create a tidal wave of Earth hundreds of feet tall that would circle the planet at 500 miles per hour, wiping out everything in its path. would trigger an Armageddon of worldwide disasters. The initial impact would literally cause the whole planet to shake. Every major fault line could fail. First is, a, is an earthquake that, uh, depending on the size and speed of the impact, could be pretty severe and it would be felt all over the world. Billions of tons of Earth heated white hot would be hurled into the atmosphere and then fall back to Earth, igniting fires over the entire planet. These secondary impacts would be, there'd be billions of them. They would be all over the world, and they would serve to raise the temperature of the whole atmosphere. If you're outside, you'd be facing temperatures as, as high as an oven set to broiling. There'd be ground fires, forest fires all over the planet. Anything that could burn would burn. The intense seismic activity causes volcanoes worldwide to erupt, blasting ash and smoke into a sky already blackened by raging fires. A black cloud forms around the entire planet. This is not a cloud that causes a day to be dull and gray. This would be a cloud that would cut off all sunlight. The day would be black, the night would be black, and it would probably last for a year. As sunlight is cut off, the temperature drops and a nuclear winter scenario begins. If it wasn't already winter time, if it were the northern hemisphere summertime, you could convert summer to winter. It would be raining. The rain would be so much laced with nitrous acid uh, it would be like the mother of all acid rains. Photosynthesis would shut down. Plants wouldn't be able to survive. 
people and animals that eat plants would not be able to survive. Uh, and creatures that eat plant-eating creatures wouldn't be able to survive. Death would just go right up the food chain. Finally, as the, the sky finally starts to clear, you get a greenhouse effect, which, which slowly builds up the temperature and could last for hundreds of years. So it's just about every environmental disaster you can think of all happening at once. It has been easy to dismiss the threat of an asteroid or comet impact but Earth-bound research and space missions within our solar system are teaching us that the probability may be higher than previously thought. One space program using improved imaging cameras is discovering four to five hundred new asteroids a night. The chances that we will die in a comet collision are about the same as the chances that we'll die in an airplane crash. And just think of how much money the U.S. spends on improving aircraft safety. And the chances are about the same. So how important is it to you to find an object which has maybe only a chance in 100,000 of killing you during your lifetime, but if it did happen, might wipe out not only you, but everybody else in the United States or even the world? The events are very rare, but when they occur, they are globally catastrophic. Uh, and the Earth's population of a billion people is, is totally a threat. Despite our growing awareness of this potential threat, funding is being cut worldwide for Space Watch programs. And we're talking about tens of millions of dollars, you know, not much more than how much you would pay for a few star athletes in football to look for more asteroids as sort of a life insurance policy against a large, against some random very large asteroid impacting the Earth over the next few hundred years. Now, why should we care? Well, first of all, it's our life. It's our civilization that's at stake here. The second thing is we have the technology that allows us to find these things, track them, and determine when and if they're going to hit the Earth. If we did find an asteroid headed for Earth, could we do anything about it? The whole answer to this is predicated on another question, and that is, when is it going to hit the Earth? If the comet that somebody discovers is going to hit the Earth within two months, there's nothing we can do. It's coming in too fast, and with two months' warning, we would not be able to do anything. If it were small enough, we, we knew where on the Earth it was going to hit, we could work to evacuate that part of the planet. Could you imagine what a problem that would be to evacuate a whole part of the planet? But if we had years instead of months, there are things we could do. It turns out if you have a long lead time, like 10 or 20 years, it doesn't take very much of a push on an asteroid to change its orbit so that you could deviate it from a dead-centered hit to a clean mess. The perfect technology to divert an incoming object may have been developed by the controversial Star Wars program. The Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, uh, originally called the Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, actually developed the technologies which allow us to, to deal with these threats. All of the things that you need to do to intercept a ballistic missile are the same sorts of things you need to do to intercept and deflect an asteroid. Then the hope is that if we know in time that we can send up a spacecraft and push them aside. Uh, this could be done with a nuclear bomb, a hydrogen bomb of some kind. Because these objects are somewhat fragile, you may end up blowing them into a sort of a shotgun blast. And when that shotgun blast comes toward the Earth, it has the potential to do just as much damage as a solid chunk coming towards the Earth. Atomic weapons may not be the best idea. 
Other means are the idea of going to an asteroid, landing on it, and setting up what they call a mass driver. This would be a device which would shoot pieces of the asteroid off at high velocity. And if you, again, set that up over many years and shot small fragments of the asteroids off in a consistent direction, you get a thrust. For every action, there's a reaction. And that asteroid could slowly be pushed out of the way. But it's time that we look out into the heavens and look at our neighbors. We are no longer children in planet Earth. We're adults now. And we can look out into the sky and see what other worlds are out there. Uh, if we fail to respond to the technical challenge of preventing these catastrophes, sooner or later, there will be an object, an asteroid or a comet that will hit the Earth and cause devastation. 99% of all living species to have ever walked the Earth are extinct, many killed off by comet or asteroid impacts. They never knew what hit them. And therein lies the difference. We are the first species to recognize this threat from space. And only by dealing with it can we ensure our future on planet Earth. <laughs>